Hi, I'm Judge Janine Pirro, and uh, you are joining me at my live book signing. I'm here in the center of New York City, Midtown we call it, and uh, I've just signed uh, several, they call them book plates, to be placed in the books, but now we're going to do an actual signing for those of you who are interested in getting my book liars, leakers, and liberals, the case against the anti-Trump conspiracy. Uh, so I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes before I take your questions and before I do the actual live signing. I am uh, sitting here with my editor. Her name is Kate Hartson. Say hi, Kate. Hi. She seems nice, but I got to tell you, <laughs> if you want to write a book, don't use her. She is a perfectionist. She makes sure everything is perfect, and I love you, you know that. And so I am so confident of, of my book and how we wrote it, and it was fun. Uh, it was a lot of work, uh, and it was a book that was pretty much motivated by what I do on my show, Justice, uh, with Judge Shanine on Fox News at Saturdays, 9 o'clock, and then it repeats at midnight, and then it repeats at 4, but my mother is the only one who watches it all three times. Um, it occurred to me that there are things going on in our government that needed to be talked about. It's almost as though things are happening uh, in the open that when I was a prosecutor, I would have brought to a grand jury immediately, but today, nothing is happening. So uh, I wrote this book, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals, uh, and it was a, it was a a fun book to write because I could talk about the reality of what goes on in law enforcement and the truth about what the media is doing to Donald Trump. The book is also about the successes that Donald Trump has had. He's a man I've known for almost 30 years and I talk about the man. This is the man that America decided should be the president, even though they didn't know him uh, as a politician. And I think that the outsider president uh, and the fact that America elected this man suggests that America really sensed that something was off and it was time for an outsider. So uh, before I get into the questions, uh, I, I just want to make sure that you know that the signed copies are available at Premier Collectibles. I'm going to spell that because I'm not the best speller. P-R-E-M-I-E-R-E. -E -E, Premier Collectibles. C-O-L-L-E-C-T-I-B-L-E-S dot com. Did you write that? No, I didn't. No, I have much better handwriting. <laughs> so, it's PremierCollectibles.com slash Piro. P-I-R-R-O. Okay, and that way uh, you can get more assigned copies if you want. And uh, I think now we're going to answer some fans' questions. But I do want to mention to you, and I'm going to give Kate a chance to talk, that you may hear some noise because it's lunchtime and we're in a big building and there, there is a lunchroom kind of on the other side. Uh, and people are being as quiet as they can be. But uh, for people like me, it's hard not to talk loud. Right, Kate? That's right. We're always we're always hushing her up. They're here, always telling me be quiet, Janine. <laughs> so we're really excited to be publishing Liars, Leakers, and Liberals. Tomorrow is our actual pub date, so you're all getting an early look. Yeah. yeah. And it's going to be launched tomorrow, and the judge is going to be all over the media, and uh, we know we're going to have a bestseller. And I'm very very happy about uh, this book. I think it's a really important book. And Janine says, Judge Janine says it was fun to write, but it was also, uh, you know, really uh, not all that easy in some ways, covering the news, yeah. covering the conspiracy. You know? you know, it's interesting. And as Kate makes eye contact with me, I know what she's thinking, and tell me if I'm wrong, that uh, writing a book about Donald Trump uh, is an extremely difficult endeavor, and I'll tell you why. Because the man is constantly moving. He is a force of nature. 
he goes from one day to the next, uh, not just accomplishing things, but taking punches and the incomings are unbelievable. But you never want to stop or finish the book. I didn't because I said, well, wait a minute, this is going to happen and this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And so I, Kate had to say to me, uh, the book is done, Janine. And I'm like, no, no, no. Do you remember? I said, no, no, we've got more that we can write. And uh, uh, but but Donald Trump is a very interesting man to uh, to write about. And there's a lot in this book when you talk about the anti-Trump conspiracy. There's a lot in here about the FBI and Peter Strzok and the fact that he was um, appeared before Congress this week is very timely for this book because you really you really make a case against him and all that they've done at the at the top of the FBI. You know, it's interesting, Kate, that um, at, at, when you mentioned that. Uh, when we wrote the book, Strzok obviously had not yet testified, uh, and yet there's so much in the book that's almost prescient that, you know, we knew the character that we were dealing with. We knew what was going on. And, you know, if you watch my show this past weekend, uh, my open was about Peter Strzok. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most uh, arrogant, condescending, sarcastic, uh, individuals I have ever seen uh, who worked for the FBI and I worked in law enforcement for over 30 years I have incredible respect for the men and women in the FBI they do great things that man is not an example of the best or the cream of the crop in the FBI and uh, ironically I mean we pretty much capture him in the book uh, although I had never heard him speak I, I just thought I have to tell you you know, his defiance and his unapologetic approach to members of Congress who have legitimate constitutional oversight uh, was stunning to me, but it's just me. And then there's uh, former director Comey. We cover him a lot in the book. <laughs> He's a bit stunning too, isn't he? Yes, he is. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who might not know, I worked with James Comey when I was a sitting DA in Westchester County. Uh, he was the United States Attorney in the Southern District of New York, and our offices in Westchester were right next to each other. And uh, Cardinal Comey, as I call him, because of his sanctimonious kind of, you know, holier-than-thou approach, uh, you know, is, is different from what we thought of him in law enforcement. And, and let, me, let me give credit where credit is due. I didn't make up the term Cardinal Comey. Uh, the men and women in the FBI called him Cardinal Comey behind his back. Uh, I'm very disappointed in the man because when he was first uh, nominated and appointed by uh, President Obama, I was so excited that someone, you know, who I thought was a believer, as, as I am in truth and justice, uh, I thought that he'd be great. But I don't know what happens if, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely or politics ideology I don't know what it is but uh, the man definitely drifted <laughs> yeah so you talk about in the book how from the day that Trump was elected this anti-Trump conspiracy just launched you know into action and it wasn't really the day after Okay. Um, if you were watching um, or reading the tweets that we found out about after the election between uh, Peter Strzok, the uh, assistant director of the FBI, the head of counterintelligence, and Lisa Page, the lawyer for the FBI, the insurance policy, and I talk about this in the book, and it's made very clear in the book. The insurance policy that I never understood, Kate, and you know, I was doing opens on this a few months back when the, when the text messages first came out. The insurance policy, I wasn't sure what it was. And then I realized that the insurance policy was plotted before Donald Trump was elected. And that insurance policy, ironically, on the day when Trump is meeting with Putin in Helsinki, that insurance policy was the Trump-Russia collusion. That's how they would be able to uh, uh, 
you know, uh, uh, dethroned, so to speak, uh, a president that the American people had put into office. That was what they could do if he were to be elected. If, as they said, the unthinkable occurred, then they would have, will have planted the seeds or would have planted the seeds for an ultimate impeachment. And the first person to use the word impeachment, I believe it was on March 17th of 2017, the day after uh, Bob Mueller was appointed, uh, was Peter Strzok. Oh and goodness. he was on that, that thread of, you know, we have to get an insurance policy in the event the unlikely uh, occurs or in the event you die before you're 40. And I talk about, in the book, um, I talk about the fact that you don't get an insurance policy to stop someone. In other words, if you have fire insurance on your home or your property, you don't buy that insurance to stop the fire. The insurance is only in the event the unthinkable or the fire occurs that you have some, some option after the traumatic or tragic event. For them, the insurance policy was the Russia collusion. And that's why these guys, uh, and I don't want to get too much into the book, but that's why these guys now are not agreeing and struck wouldn't agree to say when exactly he started interviewing witnesses when exactly did they start this counterintelligence investigation what exactly caused them to even begin a counterintelligence investigation they had to have a basis to start it and they won't give us a date and they won't tell us a basis other than a couple of people who met at a bar with an australian uh, diplomat who met this volunteer, George Papadopoulos, at a bar in London. I mean, it, it's just, it, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense, and you get it from the book. So um, they made it up, and I, you know, for those of you, and I, I guess I'll open it up to questions when you're ready, Kate, okay. but uh, for those of you who want to know about indictments, we can talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so, so we have a lot of questions here. And the first one is, do you write your own monologues, your own opening statements for the show? I'm so glad you asked. I don't know what your name is, but I love you. What's the name? Deborah. Deborah from Hackettstown, New Jersey. Deborah, I love you. I hope you're still on. Now, I write every word of those monologues. I do my own research. I write the whole thing. Nobody writes it for me. Nobody gives me the idea. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, when I first started the show, I would um, start writing my uh, open on like Wednesday, but by Friday, there's a whole new topic, so forget that. But then uh, I'd probably write Friday or Friday and Saturday. But let's say that nothing occurred to me. So by Saturday, I had to be angry about something. So my staff would say, we gotta get the judge mad uh, so we can get her focused on something that she doesn't like. But um, I do the research and I try to present the opening statement like a case. I back it with evidence and facts before I give you my opinion. It's not unlike an indictment where you put the facts out uh, and then you draw the conclusion uh, in terms of the crime that was committed. And that's exactly what I do every week on my show. Um, I love it. It's what I was trained to do. And I must tell you, uh, uh, it's, it's Deborah, right? I must tell you that, Deborah. Uh, Deborah, that I never intended to talk about politics. I mean, I ran for office five times. I, I know politics. Uh, but um, I plan to talk about criminal law on my show, Justice with Judge Janine, because crime was my wheelhouse. But there's more crime going on in Washington, D.C., than there is in courtrooms across this country. So, uh, you know, I kind of segued from crime to crime in Washington. Great, so Michael from Moose of Connecticut asks, we Oh, so okay. I'm supposed to sign a book for Deborah. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Just, just to sign. Deborah. No. Just sign. Just to sign, sign my name? But I want to personalize it, Deborah. Okay. All right, so, so here. while you're signing, Michael from Moose of Connecticut says, we hear a lot of negativity today, but would you agree that there is optimism for a reformed conservative America? 
I hope. I hope. I'm very worried. Uh, I'm very worried because the mainstream media is focused on bringing down a duly elected president of the United States. The mainstream media, the hypocrites in Hollywood, uh, you know, the left, the liars, the leakers, who before were just politicians, but now the liars and leakers are in huge positions in our Justice Department and FBI. So um, I worry, I worry, and it means that we have to be ever vigilant. We have to be able to convince, first of all, understand the facts in the book, uh, and then to convince people of what is real and what isn't real. And I think then at some point uh, we might be able to uh, bring us back. And, and Donald Trump is in that position right now of recharting the course. We were off course for eight years, and I don't think I have to get into that too much. Well, you do, in the book you cover uh, Donald Trump's administration and all of the great things he's done. I'm doing a Since coming so into I'm office, so since taking camera. office 18 months ago. There's a great section in the book about the Trump administration and all the great things the president is doing to get us back on track. Yeah, and, and you know, it's kind of interesting um, because one of the reasons that the mainstream media is, is trying to, you know, d d saying things that aren't factual, and one of the reasons the president went after the mainstream media uh, is uh, because they're ignoring the truth and the facts. But it's almost a positive thing. Uh, because, you know, he's getting all this other stuff done, and it's not positive that it's not being reported on. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is he just is in the trenches just doing what he says he was going to do. Uh, and, you know, the other day, I don't know what it was, but I, I said to someone, I said, I am getting tired of winning. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so while they focus on absurdity, Donald Trump continues to do his job. And sometimes I wonder, you know, by uh, someone who's taking all the incoming like he is, how is it that he's able to continue every day to fight? And, uh, you know, he's doing it. He's doing it well. Promises made, promises kept. That's right. Promises made. I think, who was the president who said, I mean what I say and I say what I mean? Not. So... Here's another question from Vicki in from Ocean Shores, Washington. Have you always been a conservative? And then she says, I love your tenacity, straightforwardness, and honesty. Keep up the great work on justice. Well, thank you for watching this show. That's number one, and I do appreciate it. And I wouldn't be on television uh, if, if people didn't watch my show. So thank you for that. That's number one. Uh, it's an interesting question. No one's ever asked me if I've always been a conservative. Uh, I, I, I don't know what I am. All I know is that I grew up in small town America. I worked in a dairy. Uh, my dad was a veteran of World War II, as was my grandfather. Uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, and education was prized in my family. Uh, my life and my focus has always been about uh, truth and justice, and that's why I went to law school. I went to learn about equal rights and equal justice. And when I got out of law school as a young prosecutor uh, in my first job, uh, I realized that truth and justice are very much removed from the reality of life for many, many victims of crime. And thus began my crusade. I started the first domestic violence program in the nation in 1978 when uh, my kids say the laws were written on stone tablets. Uh, and I did it because for me it's been about right and wrong and good and evil. So my, my discussion about conservatism and all that is really my interpretation of right and wrong and law and order. People can categorize it whatever way they want, but for me, I've always been a, you gotta follow the rules. If you don't follow the rules, it's not fair to this person. And that's why I fought so hard for the silent victims of crime. 
and you know today is just a continuation I see the victims today as the American people I see the abusers as the people in Washington who go there with mediocre means and come out multimillionaires people who run for our office their families are multimillionaires and that's why I wrote liars leakers and liberals it's not right it's not right so Patty from Palm Coast, Florida asks, if Hillary tries to run, will you also please? <laughs> we cannot risk her in office. <laughs> well, uh, I've run for office five times, I must tell you, Patty. I have the scars to prove it, uh, and I talk about it in the book. Uh, I'm not running again. You know, they took their pound of flesh, and I'm skinny enough. But not really, because I had rotator cuff surgery. If any of you watch my, my show or follow me, I had rotator cuff surgery. I didn't work out for five months, and I'm just be coming back. Uh, but no, I ain't running again. <laughs> Thank you, though. Joy from Batesville, Arkansas, asks, how often do you speak with President Trump, and do you ever give him advice? I tell him what I think all the time. Uh, I speak to him frequently. Uh, you know, I talk about it in the book. I talk about the fact that, you know, people say to me, okay, so you knew Donald Trump for, you have know, known him almost 30 years or whatever the number is. And is he different? No, he's not. He's not different at all. He's the same guy. He's always liked to listen to people and get their opinions. Um, sometimes uh, with me, uh, I give him my opinion even if he doesn't ask for it, if I feel really strongly about something. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I don't know in the end what he decides. He gets opinions from all sides. And he's a very smart man. And for those of you who don't know him, the man barely sleeps. I mean, my then husband was his lawyer. That's how the friendship began. Uh, many years ago and you know he, he used to call at all hours of the day and night and I remember picking up the phone picking up the phone and saying do you sleep <laughs> uh, but I was used to getting up because I was a young prosecutor and I used to be on what we call duty uh, homicide duty so whenever anybody got killed you got to run out and check it out That's tough. That's tough. so let's see Oh, here's a good one. Mitchell from Gold Canyon, Arizona, wants to know, when you served on the bench, what was your proudest moment? Mitchell, that's a very interesting question. Uh, my proudest moment on the bench. You know, on the bench, uh, and I was the first woman elected county judge in the history of my county, and I remember that my, that my opponent was saying, she's not tough enough to be a judge. <laughs> um, but the proudest moment was because I was a criminal judge, a county judge, and I pretty much was impaneling grand juries or sentencing uh, defendants, taking pleas, sitting over jury trials of felony cases. So none of it was proud or happy. But there was one thing I did several times a month as both a DA and a judge, and that was swear in newly naturalized citizens. It was one of the happiest days of the month. Uh, and and it, it was every nationality. It was Polish, Italian. Uh, it was people from you know Mexico, Spain, China, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Italy, everywhere. They were so proud to be American, to become American. They learned the Constitution. They learned about our history. They swore allegiance to our country. They were proud to wave the flag. And they brought their friends and their families, and we took pictures. These are people who work hard, who came from another land. Most of them spoke another language. You know, how many of us are, are bilingual or trilingual or, or like Melania Trump speak five languages? That was my proudest moment, swearing those people in and having them raise their right hand and say, you know, that, that they swear uh, to become citizens of this country and follow the Constitution. Man, that was great. That was great. That's wonderful. Yeah, it was. Uh, William from Terre Haute, Indiana, 
wants to know, what is it like to be you? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of traffic in there. I got to tell you, a lot of the going on. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know what you mean. I mean, uh, uh, I'm busy. I'm a busy person. Um, I, uh, he didn't say, what do you like? No, he said, what's it like? To be, to be me. I don't know to how to answer here. that. You answered that mean? it. A lot of traffic in there. <laughs> I think that's yeah. the perfect answer. <laughs> okay. Busy, busy, busy. Yep, yep. And Fran from Corona, California wants to know, do you think the country will ever accept the Trump administration? That's a great question, Fran. Uh, I fear that... Uh, those who hate Donald Trump will always hate Donald Trump. They're not willing to listen, and I talk about this in the book. They're not willing to listen. They would prefer to shut down the right, uh, and which is amazing because the left is supposed to be so understanding and so respectful of the Constitution and dialogue and free speech. Um, I think they hate this man and his family so much that in spite of all of the good things that have gone on, and again, it's in the book. I mean, we've got like the lowest unemployment in decades. We literally have more jobs in the United States now than we have people to fill them. You know, the last president said manufacturing is long gone. Well, that's wrong. Donald Trump proved him wrong. With the tax reform and the tax cuts, Four, I think is it, how many people, is it four million people or more than that, have gotten extra money, not from the tax cut, but from employers who were so happy that they are now giving employees, that when they don't have to, just extra money in their paychecks, or bonuses, or profits. Um, it, it's just, ISIS is defeated. There is no caliphate. You know, all of the things that we were so afraid of during the eight years before this president. You know, I mean, you know, someone going to show up with a knife and yell, Allahu Akbar, and you cut your head off. You know, that, that's like kind of in, on the back burner. That doesn't mean it won't happen again. But the caliphate is gone in the Middle East. So um, I, 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 I'm not optimistic that they'll accept him, but it doesn't matter because the American people who elected Donald Trump, the forgotten men and women, the ones who work two and three jobs to pay their bills, to pay their taxes, to take care of their families, they're the ones who count. And if people despise our president and hate him and hang him in effigy and, and bleeding, or you know, say you know, they should bomb the White House, well then we shouldn't care about them at all. A lot of people like you, and they're saying really nice things. They do? Yeah. Gee, you ought to walk down the street in Manhattan. A lot of them won't. Chris from Coldwater, Michigan says, Just want to say, Judge Janine, God bless you for what you do. I never miss your show. Keep up the great work. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, there's no question, God plays a big role in this. And uh, I don't take anything for granted. I don't take my show. I don't take my viewers. I don't take life for granted, and uh, I talk about that a little bit in the book also. When I talk about, uh, you know, Molly 99 and the sale of uranium by, uh, you know, approved by Hillary Clinton State Department, uranium that's used to make the Molly 99, uh, which our nuclear medicine is made from, and, and although for four years, uh, four and a half years, I never talked about having cancer or, you know, having chemotherapy, losing my hair, losing my eyebrows, losing my eyelashes. I, I mean, I was on television every Saturday and you didn't know it. This is very recent. Um, I just felt it was my fight and I did it alone. Uh, but then when I saw the connection between uh, the sale of uranium, I kept wondering why is Hillary so hot to trot to sell uranium, 145 million going to the Clinton Foundation, a quick $500,000 cash going to Bill for a 20 minute speech in Moscow. It's because nuclear medicine that 45 million people a year use to diagnose and treat, whether it's cancer, diabetes, heart disease, we're now relying on foreign governments 
to make that nuclear medicine. I don't want that anymore. And I felt so strongly about it that I divulged my personal uh, fight with cancer. Uh, I don't want these people in charge of America's nuclear medicine. It's not right. Keep signing, Judge. I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's see. Here's a question from Corey from Milford, New Hampshire. Why is there such a double standard between liberals and conservatives, especially when being prosecuted? And he also says, he or she also says, thank you. We enjoy your show each weekend on Fox News. Thank you. Thank you again for watching. Uh, why is there a double standard? Uh, there is a double standard. You know, Lady Justice, uh, and I had her statue behind me for the 30 years that I was in law enforcement, uh, she's supposed to be blind. But unfortunately, in this country, uh, and, and I you know, there are people who are above the law. And when I used to try cases, uh, and I tried many cases during my career as an assistant DA, before I became the DA, I would always say to a jury, I would always say, ladies and gentlemen, no one is above the law and no one is beneath it. But all those years of saying that, and I question it today, because there are people who are above the law. So why is that? To answer your question, I think you'd have to go to some of my opens over the past year. I am furious with some Republicans. I am furious uh, with people in the Justice Department. They are not handling uh, justice the way it should be handled. If you do an investigation where classified secrets are put at risk, where a, uh, a, a hacker can say that Hillary Clinton's emails, for example, on a private server were like an open orchid on the internet. Uh, if you have that, then you have to realize that you have to do a serious investigation. Grand jury, search warrant, subpoenas. But instead, we had no grand jury. We had immunity uh, uh, that was handed out like a candy at a, at a child's birthday party where people would be given immunity, which means they can't be prosecuted for what they're talking about, without the concomitant, you know, you've got to testify against this person. If I'm going to give you immunity, if I'm going to give you queen for a day, as we used to call it in, in, uh, in the prosecutor's office, then you got to give me something because you did something bad. And I'm only going to cover you if you give me something, if I can climb the ladder and get someone else. They didn't do that. Jim Comey didn't do it. Loretta Lynch didn't do it. Instead, they just made believe they were investigating Hillary Clinton. And I'll tell you right now, all they needed to do was ask that woman one question. Did you put classified secrets uh, on your personal server, yes or no. If she said yes, that's a crime. If she said no, that's a lie and lying to the FBI. Martha Stewart went to jail for lying to the FBI. Why is this woman different? Why? I'll tell you why. Because the Clinton Foundation has its tentacles all through Washington all through the power grid down there. And so everyone covers for her. Everyone is beholden to her. And it's a shame. It's a damn shame. And I didn't finish. <laughs> and the problem is that the Democrats know how to fight. The Republicans don't. Uh, what is it, the Marcus of Queensberry rules, you know, the Republicans are, you know, got their hands behind their backs and the Democrats have switchblades, shotguns and, you know, a rope. Uh, that's what's going on. And I think you saw it epitomized in the hearings of Peter Strzok. I never saw so much pandemonium as I saw in Congress. You know, the, the Republicans were genteel. They were like the, the, the gentlewoman from here or there, you know, overruled. Over, no, 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 get on your medication. You know, it was crazy. It was crazy. Republicans don't know how to fight. Or maybe the Republicans 
are so much the rhinos, Republicans in name only, and I talk about that in the book too, that, <coughs> bless you, uh, Republicans in name only, that they don't want the swamp cleaned up. They'd rather keep it the way it is. So Elmo from Reynoldsburg, Ohio, wants to know, so Judge, what's going to be the outcome of this assault on our republic? Some great questions, guys. Um, Keep signing while you think of your answer. No, I know what my answer is. I just want to put it in a way where people don't lose faith. Um, here's the thing. Who's running the Justice Department right now? Rod Rosenstein. Did President Trump appoint Rod Rosenstein? No. Rod Rosenstein was a Deputy Attorney General who convinced Jeff Sessions not, uh, I mean, to recuse himself and not get involved in anything having to do with the 2016 campaign. Therefore, Rod Rosenstein will make the decisions as to what goes on in the Department of Justice in addition to what's going on in the Mueller probe. So, Rod Rosenstein, folks, do you remember when, you may or may not remember, I talked about this on Justice, the Russians were infiltrating the United States to try to find out where they could buy uranium, where, who they could bribe, who they could pay off, so that the Russians could buy uranium, which is that essential ingredient, not just to nuclear power, nuclear bombs, but to nuclear health and Mali 99. So they were prosecuted because there was a whistleblower, someone who went to the FBI and said, those Russians are coming over here, they're trying to, they're trying to buy our uranium. And the truth is that the prosecutor who prosecuted the case uh, who took a plea deal outside the guidelines, did it on Labor Day weekend, did a sentence outside the guidelines at Christmas holiday, was Rod Rosenstein. So you got Rod Rosenstein who's covering up for the Russians at that end, and the guy who was the head of the FBI at the time was none other than Bob Mueller. All right, Jim Comey is the United States Attorney in the Southern District, at the same time. And so, and Andrew McCabe, they were all friends with each other. This is a cabal. This is a conspiracy. This is a group of people who uh, are part of the anti-Trump conspiracy. But it's not just that they're anti-Trump. What it is, is the fact that uh, they gotta cover their, their butts by making sure that they got Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General, out of the way where they control the Justice Department and FBI, where nobody in Congress is impeaching them or holding them in contempt, where it just drags on and on and on. But I think it was Daryl Issa who said on my show this weekend, he said, you know, Janine, um, I think it was Daryl, the congressman from California, I think he said, you know, even if nothing happens, even if there is no prosecution of these criminals, and they are, then Maybe the best thing is that the American people have seen the veil taken away in what really goes on in the swamp. And they have their own sense of justice, they have their own instincts. Because the American people instinctually knew that we needed an outsider. And that's why they picked Donald Trump. I think we've covered a lot of subjects here. So, what's next? Uh-oh, 22 questions in two minutes. Really? Nobody told me about this. <laughs> no. Should I keep signing or I'll just answer the questions? Keep I probably signing. need, no, I, I need to think. These are fast, real fast. No okay. thinking. Where were you born? Elmira, New York. Did you ever hear of it? Yes. Who would you want to play in a movie? Oh, that's, that's tough. I don't know. Who would I want to play? Oh, who do I want to play, me? Uh, you know, uh, what's her name? She was in uh, My uh, Cousin Vinny. Oh, yeah. What's her name? What's her name? Well, she was in My Cousin Vinny. Uh, you're probably yelling to yourselves out there. Uh, I see Eva Longoria for you. Oh, oh everybody oh, says, Eva yeah. Longoria. They always say, is oh. Eva Longoria could be your sister? And I say, no, she could be my daughter. Um, uh, what's the name? Come on, Marissa come on. Tom Marissa yes. Tomei. 
That's it, Marissa Tomei, because she's tough. And she didn't like that they were shooting Bambi, and I'm an animal lover. But I shoot. Okay, okay quick. What was your first job? <laughs> uh, my first job was selling uh, photos over the telephone. And when I was a kid, I was like, I don't know, 14, and I would say, wouldn't you like someone to have a beautiful picture of you? I'm with Olin Mills, and we can send you uh, our photographer there now for $10 or whatever it was at the time. And they'd say, honey, ain't nobody wants my picture. I said, but maybe someday someone will want your picture. And I used to win the BTO. You know what that stands for? No. Best telephone operator. I'm not surprised. <laughs> and then I worked in a dairy. <laughs> oh, what's your biggest fear? Uh, my biggest fear is um, is losing the America that our founding fathers created. Free speech is really important. And what makes you laugh the most? <laughs> uh, I love to laugh. You may know that. Um, I, I love to laugh. I love to joke. What makes me laugh? Uh, I like slapstick. I like dumb movies where I can just sit there and I have popcorn and I make it myself because I don't want to make it an oil. I don't want to get the microwave. But then to show you how crazy I am, I'll put the uh, junior mints in it. So oh, the popcorn's, do you love it? Oh. So the popcorn's hot, it melts the junior mints. So you never know if you're getting salt or sugar and there's no butter, so I feel like I didn't do anything really wrong. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's also great with M&Ms. I don't eat M&Ms. Oh, well. So there. Well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what's the one thing you need to have in your fridge at all times? Yogurt. And I'll tell you what, when it goes bad, I put it on my face. I That's never told you tip. that, did I? That's a great All tip. Right. <laughs> What's your favorite adult beverage? I used to be tequila. It ain't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Not for that. Uh, who's the most interesting person you met recently? <laughs> <laughs> um, recently. You must have been a cab driver. It could be a cab driver. Uh, it could be, um, I met a lady uh, who talked to me about cooking. I like to cook. And uh, she talked about all the places that she went in the world where she learned how to add this kind of um, angle or this kind of you know taste to this particular food. And I was fascinated. So I went home and tried to put it all together. It was a disaster. But she was interesting, yeah. Okay, uh, what's your middle name? Ferris, that's my maiden name. I never had a middle name. I'm Janine Ferris Pirro. I used to be Janine Ferris till I got married. And what's your biggest pet peeve? When people lie to me. I hate it when people lie to me. It makes me crazy. I don't care if you're the exterminator or if you're someone in a criminal courtroom or if you're in Washington. I hate it when people lie. It just makes me nuts. What's the last book you read? Uh, what is the last book? I know book you that like I thrillers. Yeah, I'm trying to think what I read. You know what I'm reading? You're not going to be, you won't find this interesting. Um, I'm reading Scalia's last book. I have books that I keep and that I keep going back to them. And I don't read fun books like thrillers until I'm on vacation. And I haven't been on vacation in a long time. Uh, I read a lot. Of, I read a lot of periodicals, newspapers, blogs. Um, but I mean, I I like um, I do like thrillers. You gave me. Uh, I love Nelson DeMille. Love Nelson love DeMille. Nelson. Uh, the Cuban. What was it? The Cuban. Cuban I, affair. Cuban affair. Yeah, I read all his books. And you know what I used to love reading was not around anymore. Sidney Sheldon. That's really great oh, for a beach. Yeah. That's from like a hundred yeah, years ago. It is. I remember him. So, what's your favorite hobby? Do you have any hobbies? I don't have time for a no. hobby. You know, I, I have dog. I have a dog. I used to have yeah. two dogs. You know, if you watch Justice, um, I love playing with my dogs. When I have time, now that I'm healed, uh, although I'm going to physical therapy right after we're done here, they they gave me an hour off today. Um, I like to work out when I can, but. Uh, 
you know, I, I love going to the movies. I, I love just sitting there and not thinking uh, and uh, just watching other people and their lives. Okay, what is your guilty pleasure? Dark chocolate. Oh, yeah. Junior Mints. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's number one on your bucket list? I got to go to Prague. I got to go to Prague, and I'll tell you why. I don't know anything about Prague. I don't have anybody in Prague. But I love the Prague Philharmonic, okay? I love it. The city of Prague Philharmonic. They do all the movie uh, uh, um, uh, themes. And uh, every time I go on a website, it's in Czech. And I can't figure it out, and I'm not smart enough to figure it out. So maybe somebody out there can send something to my Facebook. I'm dying to go to Prague. <laughs> what else? Um, how do you take your coffee? Uh, no, I, I'm trying not to put sugar in it, but I, I, I think you can figure it. I'm not doing well on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so cream and sugar. Do you have any hidden talents? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I'm a decent cook. I'm a decent cook, um, but I don't think I have any hidden talents. Mm -hmm. uh, I love to clean. What's wrong with that? Uh, I could clean your house in a minute. <laughs> uh, what are my hidden talents, Kate? I don't know. You haven't They're seen hidden. any, have you? <laughs> We've been together a lot, her and I. So we have to tell everybody to make sure to go to premiercollectibles.com slash hero. Okay, P-R-E-M-I-E-R-E, -E -E, collectibles, C-O-L-L-E-C-T-I-B-L-E-S dot com slash P is in Piro, I or Peter, P-I-R-R-O. That's my last name, Piro. Thanks for being with us today. I really appreciate it. I love you all. I love reading what you send, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, for listening, uh, for buying my book, uh, and for being part of an America that really wants to make it great again. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Kate.